the mountain, in the valley, in the crowded streets, or the empty desert. In our hope, and in our waiting, we are never alone. God is with us. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. Hey, would you just thank Jason once again for being here with us today and sharing his story? And we're looking forward to having him back next tonight. Uh, he's, a, he's been a friend for a number of years now. And he, one thing I love about him, he's just a real guy. And that's what I absolutely love. Well, Merry Christmas and uh, uh, Merry Christmas to you and, and yours. Before we jump into part four of our God uh, with us teaching series, just a quickle, a, a quickle. That's many words put together. A quick few thank you. I want to thank all the change agents here today. And and what I mean by that is that God is using you to do unbelievable things. Um, Number one, you know, we have a women's ministry that kind of relaunched. And they just, they relaunched with a, a, a complete full room of, of ladies. And God's doing a cool thing there. We're praying for a movement of women through our women's ministry in Lexington. And then also, God is doing some great things through our college ministry. We've had some people come to Christ as their Savior, and then they're inviting their athletic teams to be a part of what's going on. Uh, God is saving people, then they're getting baptized, and then people are serving. I mean, it's just, just awesome. God is doing some great things, so we're thankful for that. So number one, thanks for inviting. Okay, thank you. You know, 80%, they say, will come if you just simply invite them. So thank you to for inviting people to our Christmas Eve services, all five million of them, thank you. Uh, And then second of all, um, thank you for your generosity. Here's why I say that. Because God is truly doing a work. And and you may not know this, but here's what I want you to know. In the last month, somebody, by the grace and mercy of God, just kind of came up on their own, and they gave our administrator a check for $200,000 to go towards our debt. Isn't that awesome? Thank you. And um, here's why that's amazing. Because of your generosity and your faithfulness, not only we're continuing to see missions happen all over our country and our our city and state with Christmas for Christ, offering that we're still collecting, but also, also, we have been able to pay one-third of our debt down, which means we are really, really, really close. And because we're really, really close, we are committed, the finance team is committed to becoming a a church that is debt-free so that we can give more to the kingdom like never before. And so I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, God is blessing. And so what I'm going to ask, if you're a visitor, don't even worry about this, but if you're a change agent at Emmanuel, would you pray and ask God, God, how can I end this year and help, you know, close out the gap for this debt? My wife and I are praying about it, and I'm going to ask you would do the same. So let me pray, and then we'll jump in. God, thank you so much for what we're about to hear in your word, and thank you for the change agents here at Emmanuel, and thank you, God. We get to be a part of celebrating the birth of the child king. In your name we pray. Everyone said amen. All right, so as I said, we're in part four of a message series entitled God With Us. And I'd love you to get out your listening guide and then also find Isaiah chapter 9 and Matthew chapter 10. We're going to be there. And the prophet, 700 years previous to the baby king Jesus being born, prophesies. It's unbelievable. We've been looking through it and studying Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says this, for a child will be born For us, Jason just sang about the child king. A son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. And and this is what Jesus is going to be and is, right? Wonderful counselor. Yes, right? Mighty God. We talked about that. Eternal Father. Love it. We talked about it last week. And then finally, he will be the Prince of Peace. The, 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 The baby king would be born. He'd grow up to be a man. He would lay his life down upon the cross, but then three days later, he'd be resurrected from the grave. He would give his life as an atoning sacrifice that he would literally create the good news that we experience here. That's why we celebrate Christmas. So we hear all that, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Oh, yay, it's awesome. But let me ask you this question today. When do, and what do we do when things aren't peaceful? 
Like we hear all this stuff, we think all these things, we feel all these things. What do we do when things aren't peaceful? I mean, nothing brings out all the emotions of all kinds of angst like Christmas. You, you, you suppress them all year long, you get by, and then in the month of December, everything starts coming to the service. All the relatives or work coworkers or all these things that you've been suppressing, things you've been processing through, they all kind of come to the service. What do you do, right? And then Christmas time doesn't help any because of some of the traditions. One of the traditions is the Christmas card. I mean, we've gotten like five million Christmas cards this year, okay? And I love all of them. We didn't send one out, so it makes me feel guilty every time I get one. Have you ever sent out a bunch of Christmas cards and then you get from one from somebody else you didn't send to and then you're like, what do I do now? They're not going to like me as a friend. Well, we, you get these Christmas cards. And I don't know if you're like me or not, but you get the Christmas card and you're like, that is a perfect family. I mean, they all match. Even their dog matches. <laughs> and then you look at your family, you're like, my family's jacked up, but look at this family. And then you're like, ah, oh, you don't feel peaceful anymore. Or, or maybe you're, you know, you're, you're a member of, at Emmanuel, you're involved at Emmanuel, and we, we, we say we want you to be in discipleship group. We want you to be on, in a group on Sunday morning or Sunday night or throughout the week because we believe that, that community matters and belonging matters, but also the gospel working in through your life and community is so important. And a part of that is, you know, each group, hopefully, will pray for each other. So you get in a group and you'll be sharing about just things you're going through. And so one person shares this request and then another goes, I got a praise report. And you're like, oh no, here we go. We we're almost done. Uh, and this person says like, you know what? I, I just, just want to thank everlasting God, almighty father. And you're like, well, at least he's been listening to Pastor Ray, you know, and, and they say, you know, I just want to thank him because I was on New Circle Road and the Holy Spirit came upon me as I was praying and asking God to give me wisdom around what gift to get my wife because I've been delaying it and I had like four days left and the Spirit of God said, get off here go to this store. And there's this parking spot right up front and a park there. And right about then you're going, I don't want to hear anymore. And they park there and then they go in and there's the gift. Oh, right, right there. And they get the gift and it's the perfect gift. And, and you're thinking to yourself, I know I'm supposed to love this person, but I don't want to hear anything else. And, and so this, this uneasiness is kind of a in and through and a part of our life. And and maybe you're thinking, you know, I hear the Prince of Peace, but I don't feel much peace. I don't read the, 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 the headlines. I don't feel much peace, all the stuff going on. And maybe because you don't feel peace because it's something, honestly, that you've done. You've said something, you've done something. Maybe it's your mouth. I, my mouth gets me into trouble more than anything else. Hey, you say something, you're like, oh, and now you've got to face it. Maybe that's why you're not feeling peace. And you can deal with it, and I'm praying grace upon you. Or maybe today you... It's something someone's done to you. It's an uncontrollable circumstance. You've been hurt. You've been wounded. You've been maybe even abused. Or, or maybe you were just given news you did not want to hear, and now you're not feeling much peace. But then there's a third one, and this is where I kind of want to take us today. You're not feeling peace because you know, you've made the decision to follow Jesus Christ. And because of that, you're, you're not feeling much peace in your life because of some of the stuff that's happening around you. So I want to ask you a question that was asked of me recently, and that is this. What did it cost you to follow Jesus? What did it cost you? I mean, if, if, if I were to be honest with you today, here's what it cost me. I started following Jesus Christ when I was late in my teenage years. It costs me maybe a few friends, but man, I'll tell you what, the community I've been given ever since is amazing. And, and then I had to put off some gratification for some long-term gain. I mean, honestly, I've been given so much more than I could ever give. And it cost me. But some of you here today, you, it's cost you everything to follow Jesus. Or, or perhaps people around the world, we read about that it's cost them everything. And, and so as we dive into Matthew chapter 10, what I believe Jesus is encouraging to you and to me and people around the world, that it's going to cost you something to follow the way of Jesus Christ. But it is worth it. So I want you to look at Matthew chapter 10, and we're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 25, really in way of context. And, and the context of Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 through 25 is this, that Jesus has his disciples. He sends them out on basically like a mission trip, if you will. And they go out on this mission trip. And he goes, hey, before you go, real quick, 
This isn't the kind of trip you're going to walk away and feel really, 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 really good about because all these things went your way. In fact, no, 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 no. There's going to be sheep, or there's going to be wolves, and you're the sheep. That's not very encouraging. He says, things are going to happen to you. It's not going to be easy. If I'm one of the disciples, I'm thinking, man, great pep talk, Jesus. He said, listen, if you're, if you're all about, you know, looking for unicorns and, and, and just follow la la la, this is not the deal. He goes, this is not going to be easy. So then this is the context. So look at verse 26 with me. He says, therefore, don't be afraid of them. Since there is nothing covered that won't be uncovered and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What you hear in a whisper, cro- proclaim on the housetop. He says, don't fear. That's the first time he says it. But then also he, he says, you know, don't be afraid of them. Who, who is the them? The them are those who are persecuting them. Then in verse 28, he says, don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both you, both soul and body in hell. Jesus is saying, look, don't fear. Second time he said it. Don't fear. Don't fear them. They can kill you. If I'm, if I'm the disciples, I'm saying, time out. I, that's easy for you to say. But I don't want to die, Jesus, okay? I'm a little bit fearful about losing my life. He says, don't worry about that actually fear the one, me, who can actually, can literally do anything I want. He's saying this, like, it, the more you put your eyes on Jesus, the less you're going to put your anxiety and worry on anything else. Why? Well, it's because of what Isaiah said. It's what Jason Gray sang about just a little bit ago. Why? Well, because he is mighty God. He is everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. And so, because of that, if you're, if you're, if you're listening, guide number one, peace has a name. And peace has a name, and the name is Jesus. The world wants to name peace all the time. If you are join a political party, an agenda, well, the man, you have peace. Or if, or, or, or if you arrive at this income, man, you'll have peace. Or, or if you wear this, or you have this social status, or if you have this many followers, or this many likes or you drive this kind of car, well, then you, they'll name peace. But let me tell you, don't let anybody, don't let the world ever try to tell you and name peace. There's only one peace, and his name is Jesus. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And then in um, verse 29, this awesome king, he says this. He says, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's Consent, but even the hairs of your head will have been counted, so don't be afraid. Therefore, you are worth more than many sparrows. You're driving down the road, you're, you're going to pass maybe perhaps hundreds, thousands of sparrows. It doesn't even mind. You don't even look, or maybe you say, Oh, there's a bird. But what does God do? He actually cares about every single one of those tiny little birds. And, and not only that, but He knows every hair on your head or used to be on your head. Ladies, he knows what color your hair was last year, (laughs) this year, and will be a year from now. Some of you wonder why I can't keep track of your names because your hair changes, and that's just not fair. I look the same, and what Jesus is saying here is that, listen, I'm omniscient, I'm omnipotent. I know everything. I'm in complete control. I'm awesomely sovereign and intensely personal. That's Jesus. See, peace has a name. And because peace has a name, for the third time, he says, don't fear. And here's why. Jesus gives peace with God. That you can have peace with God because he is the prince of peace. That word peace, if you do a deep dive into it real quickly, I'll do it with you. It means shalom in the Hebrew language. And what this word would be used for at times is they would, those people would be, used, would be building a wall. And you don't want to build a wall with holes, but what would happen is when they built the wall with these perfectly cut stones and everything was filled in perfectly, then they would build this wall that had no cracks or crevices that really were to speak of. So they would say, that's shalom. So when you were lived in a city with a shalom wall, man, you were living in shalom. 
but yet our, our, our humanity, right? It's full of cracks. It's full of crevices. There's holes everywhere. Why? Because we're broken people. We're messed, jacked up people. Honestly, we are, right? You are. I am. But what does God do? He says, well, you know what? While you were still broken, while you were still a sinner, I came. You can't fill in all the holes, even though you're trying, even though I'm trying. God comes into the picture. He fills all of the holes, and that's why he brings shalom. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. We have shalom with God because he's come to restore, bring us wholeness with God. Jesus gives peace with God, but also Jesus gives the peace of God. Don't miss this. My, my kids, my two little girls, is, I love one of the things when, when we're watching a movie and there's a scary scene in the movie. I kind of love it. Here's why. Because what they do is they just kind of scoot a little bit closer to me on the couch. Kind of put their head on my shoulder. It's like my favorite part. Now, why do they put their head on my shoulder? They put their head on my shoulder because dad is bigger and badder than the scary scene, right? In the same way, Jesus is saying, listen, I'm your dad, and because I'm your everlasting father, because I'm your mighty God, because I'm your wonderful counselor, you, I can give you peace. And because he brings the peace of God, that means peace has an infinite supply. I was thinking about this word infinite versus finite, limited versus infinite unlimited. Have you ever been given a blank check before? I've been given a blank check one time and there were still parameters. I'm not going to tell you what I wrote on the check, but it was pretty cool. But what if today at the door, Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon in the world, he walks up, he's there at your front door and he goes, hey, here's a check. Go ahead, have fun, spend all the money you want. You couldn't spend all the money he's got. Wouldn't it be fun though to try what this means here is that Jesus gives you an infinite supply of his peace. It's never going to run out. Even in a world that everything has a start and a stop, there is no stop. That's why the Apostle Paul, he writes in Philippians 4.19, And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now, here's what's so interesting. This is coming from the guy. He, his resume is long and longer than mine, and longer than yours, and what he's encountered. Man, this guy's been shipwrecked, this guy's been beaten, this guy's been left for dead, this guy basically doesn't have a home, this guy's been in prison, this guy has been completely run out of town, and he said, my God supplies all the peace I ever could ever imagine or want. Jesus is his supplier of peace. But the, the, the challenge, though, for us, at least for me, is, is that I look to my wife, I look to my friends, my work, my calling. I look to all the things around me to be my supplier of peace. I don't know about you. And every single time that I put all of my peace on my wife, what inevitably ends up happening is I end up crushing her. Why? Because she wasn't designed to be my supplier of peace. Anytime you put all of your peace on your spouse or your family or your friends or your work or whatever the case, inevitably they will run short Now, for those of you in the room, those of you who are watching online or on TV, um, you, there's iMag, right? There's these big screen up there. And, and, and from the screen, I mean, I look like I'm 6'4", and 270 pounds, bench press 350, and squat 600, and look like I could be a middle linebacker for an NFL team, right? But that's the camera, okay? I'll let you in on a little secret. I could get out on the NFL uh, field and I could try to play middle linebacker as soon as Zeke Elliott, one of the best running backs in the country, storms at me and I try to tackle, I'm going to lose. In fact, I will probably lose my life trying to tackle that guy. Okay. See, that's exactly what happens every single time that you, you try to be something you're not. Every time you look to something that's not supposed to be your supplier. Let me ask you, friend, who are you looking for to be your supplier of peace? And that's important because this is all kind of setting up for what Jesus says next there in verse 32. Look at it with me. He says, therefore, 
Everyone who will acknowledge me before others, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny him before my Father in heaven. Don't assume that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. You're reading that, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. What happened to Luke chapter 2? What happened to this unbelievable, cute nativity scene? What happened to the baby Jesus? What happened to all of that? That was just so precious. This is, he, now he's carrying a sword? What's going on? Well, the, what's going on is this. There are a bunch of doctors in our church, and these doctors have been trained to, to utilize the tool of a scalpel. And what this verse is referring to is that Jesus has this razor-sharp scalpel, and he's cutting away the cancer. He's cutting away the tumor. He's cutting away the things that shouldn't be there so that you can live not only in this life, but in the life to come the way God originally designed you to live. This is what he's doing. That's why he brought the sword. Then in verse 35 and following, he continues, he says, "'For I came to turn a man against his father,' a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I just thought that was funny, especially around the holidays. I don't know about if you did, but I did. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. Verse 37, the one who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves a son or a daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone, I love this, who finds his life will lose it. And anyone who loses his life because of me will find it. This is important around this this time of year because you're going to encounter people in your life in the next few days as a follower of Jesus Christ. They're just not going to like you for what you're doing as a follower of Christ. You started in the same place, maybe a family member's, you But man, the destinations are maybe moving in a different direction. You're going this way, they're going this way. But as Jesus is in your life, you're going to be more of the light of the world. You're going to be salt to the earth. And because of that, you're not going to, you know, being around you is going to be a little different, right? Hopefully. And and maybe you're going to even be accused. This, This country today more than ever before, I mean, Christians are being labeled as racist because of this and because of that. Maybe you're going to be called names. Maybe you're going to be shunned. Maybe you're going to be made fun of. I mean, you you give what to the church? Like, you give all that time and all that effort. What are you doing? What a waste. Like, they're going to see these things and, and, and maybe even share those things. But Jesus isn't saying here, you guys go ahead and hate them. No, what he's saying is just don't take your family. Don't take your friends. Don't take anybody and make them the main thing. Kill that idol of, like, family and just worship me love your family but make me number one he's saying this that there's there's a cost to following jesus right but it is worth it so this last thursday i was heading from here all the way back to my hometown i was i I was in a three and a half hour car ride there drove home thursday night got there 10 o'clock um, and slept real quickly, got up the next day, and spent some time with my grandma, who's ailing. And then I got back in the car and came back here to Lexington, got home about five. Spent some time with her, sat next to her, hugged her neck, kissed her on, the, on, the, on top of the head. She's in her 90s. She's not doing very well. She's a nurse. I want to thank God for that nursing home. I just wanted to be around her. On the way back, I'm just thinking about this morning and thinking about the weekend, and God begins to like make me pivot what I'm going to share. And one of my favorite teachers of the Bible, he asks this question so penetrating, and then God says, I really want you to ask the church that. And I thought, really, God? Okay, I will. And what really captured me was this question, are we a consumer Christian or are we a follower of Jesus? Are you following Jesus because it makes it better in your life? It's like you're extracting good things like what maybe you can get out of Jesus. Like you're looking for more wealth or you're looking for more friends or you're looking for more social status. Friend, let me tell you, Jesus, what does he do? He dies broke, destitute, alone, and most of his friends ran. Sorry to burst your bubble, but that's what happens. And I don't know. I, I don't know if you're a consumer or a follower of Jesus. I was convicted by this. <laughs> and maybe it's pastors. I don't know. Maybe us pastors, we've messed it up. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe it's other pastors' fault. 
around the country. I mean, after all, you did park in a really nice parking lot, right? You didn't have very far to walk. I mean, you walk like a mile and a half to Rupp Arena. You only walked like, you know, 100 yards at tops. And there was a golf cart if you didn't want to walk. Someone would be like driving around, hey, you want us to pick you up? And you guys, and you walk in the door and we're not asking you for a ticket. We're just, hey, glad you're here. Here's something to follow along with today. And then you come in and nice, comfortable seating, so comfortable you're falling asleep right now and it's warm, right? You're enjoying it. And then we have children's ministry that just is incredible at Emmanuel. And we, we are so thankful for it. And typically you drop your, maybe if you have kids, you drop your kids off and you get like a whole hour or two or three hours without kids. We disciple them, but you see it as babysitting, right? Or maybe you don't, but some of you do. I've heard you say it, all right? But, and, and maybe perhaps your child has a bad day, and maybe perhaps they're demon-possessed. I don't know, but let's, let's say they are. We don't put it on the screen, uh, Johnny Smith is demon-possessed, please get them. No, we don't. We just you know, basically give you a code and you, the code means come get your child. And, and there we're holding the child and we don't say, come get your demon possessed child. You might need an exorcist. What we do is we say, hey, we'll be praying for you. No, we don't even do that. We just say, here's your child back. So maybe it's my fault. I don't know. But are we consumer Christians or are we followers of Jesus? So this story that just rocked my world, is, it's, his name is Adoniram Judson, and he was the first Baptist missionary to India, and he's courting this girl, and he writes his future father-in-law a letter to gain permission to marry her in 1811. He writes this. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring, to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure to the heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the summer climate of India, to every kind of want, d d distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all of this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you? For the sake of perishing in, in immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God, can you consent to all of this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness brightened by the acclamations of praise which sound resound to her Savior from heavens saved through her means from eternal woe and despair? Now, I don't know about you, but I asked my future and father-in-law to marry my wife a little differently than that. No letter, especially about the glory of God and all. I just said, would you please? I know I'm an idiot. Would you please give her hand to marry me? So he would consent, and, and what would happen is he would not see her again. They would give their lives for the sake of the of the gospel and what would happen is just nothing short of unbelievable. If you were to go there today, what you'll find is 4,000 some churches that are there because and trace back to what happened because of the Judson family. And on top of that, they say half a million Christ followers. See, if you're looking for circumstantial peace, this Prince of Peace, he may not give you all the right circumstances, friend, but he will supply what you need to get through what you're going through. And it is not impossible some of you are going through the most horrific pain. Some of you have been maybe abused and hurt. Listen, friend, if that's you, I'm so sorry. Or you're going through a relationship heartache or you're facing something or you just got news or whatever the case is. But I was confronted with this scripture and I want to just share this with you from the, my, my deepest part of my heart as a follower of Jesus Christ. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We can't get away from it. It says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the whole world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Here's what that means. Number one, that means that if you are a follower of Jesus, that means that you, friend, your past is in the past. You've been given a new day. You've been born again because, of, I mean, he's told that to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and that story in John chapter 4. You've been given a new, and everything you did in the past, it's in the past. You've been forgiven. 
Glory to God, you have been given grace. And now, friend, he has now made you his ambassador to those around you. He has made and given you the ministry of reconciliation. So here's the question. What if you're going through what you're going through so that the glory of God and the light of Jesus needs to be shown in that dark time? What if you're going through what you're going through, you're enduring the pain that you're enduring so that he can make himself glorified in and through your life? What if you're coming into contact with that one person and it hurts you so very badly, but what if you're literally coming into contact with that person and he has an unbelievable sovereign plan and that sovereign plan is for their life to be transformed because the gospel is being lived out in your life? See, friend, you are, you're being called and made to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And so as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, our takeaway today, I just want to give you two. The first one is real simple, and that is we just must love people. I, I heard it said this last week, man, we just need to tolerate everybody. It's all about tolerance, right? Tolerate people. But, but to be honest with you, do you know what tolerance is? You don't really like them, but you just kind of put up with them, right? I'm just going to tolerate them. Time is ticking, then I don't have to be around them. But what are Christians called to do? We're called to love people. <laughs> We're called to love people. Jesus said to love your enemies, to turn the other cheek, according to what the Gospel of Matthew talks about. As ambassadors of Christ, we're to love people. And then, and then second of all, our second takeaway is we, as ambassadors of Christ, we must forgive people. Wow. Somebody hurts you. Somebody has said something, done something multiple times. or There's hurt and there's pain and you want to seek revenge. You want justice to be had. And then God comes along and he forgives you. And then he says, as an ambassador of Christ, you've got to forgive those around you. It doesn't feel good to do that, does it? If I was your enemy, here's what I would tell you. I would say, you know what? I just want you to forgive based on how you feel. I don't want you to go by anything else. If you feel like you shouldn't forgive them, don't forgive them. Just be locked up in that pen of hatred and revenge the rest of your life, and the only thing that will happen is, is that you, my friend, will be the very victim that you want the other person to become. If, that, if I was your enemy, that's what I'd tell you. What does God say? He says, you know what? What did I do for you? You're an ambassador of Christ. Do for others. There's all kinds of feelings today, and maybe you don't feel like you want to forgive uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so or your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your coworkers, whatever the case is, your roommate. They've done this, they've done that, and you know what God is calling you to as an ambassador of Christ? He's saying, I want you to forgive that person. I don't care how you feel. I want you to make the decision, and I want you to go back to the gospel over and over and over and over and over and over again because I have forgiven you such, so will you forgive much? 70 times 7, the point, an unlimited amount. Can't do it on your own, Prince of Peace is there to give you what you need. We have all these feelings. That's what makes Christmas so great, right? There's all these feelings and emotions and traditions. And I love traditions. I mean, you grew up one way. Maybe if you're, if you're married, your spouse grew up another. One of the funniest things that happened was when my wife and I had our first Christmas together. It's Christmas morning. And she goes, all right, this is how we're going to do Christmas. And I'm all ears. And she says, we're going to open our presents one at a time and watch and talk about it. I said, what pagan cult are you from? Like, we just tear into them. We're done in five minutes, but it's fun. You're going to hear, feel all these emotions and all these things and what God wants you to do. As an ambassador of Jesus Christ, he wants you to forgive. Why? It's going to cost you something, but as a follower of Jesus Christ, it's worth every moment. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to call out the band and our musicians, and they're going to lead us in a song. And as they lead us in a song, I'm just going to ask you to stand to your feet. You're facing something. You're feeling something. 
And you, you don't sense the Prince of Peace. Maybe that's you because of something you're going through, or maybe that's because you don't feel like you can love, you can forgive. Or maybe you're just going through something so deep, so gnarly that you can't put your arms and can't get through that. We're going to sing this song, and it's about being a way maker. God is for us. And so what I'm going to do is as soon as they start to, to, to sing that song, I'm going to ask that you would just take a huge step of faith, get out from where you are. I know this is embarrassing. And you're like, wait a minute, if I get out and admit that I need help, then other people are going to see that I need help. Guess what? We all need some help. So as they get ready to, to lead us in worship, I'm going to ask you to take a giant step of faith, get out from where you are, just come to the front, and I'm going to just collectively pray for us. In just a moment. So let me pray, and then as soon as I say amen, I'm going to ask you to take a giant step. If you're in the balcony, your, your, your friends and family will wait for you, okay? You come down front, just hang out down here. Maybe you're here today, and you need to experience God. Heavenly Father, thank you. You meet us right where we are, and that you are our Prince of Peace. And now, Lord, as we worship you, take our hearts and transform them and give us what we desperately need. In your name we pray, amen.